Welcome back to the Matter Facts Podcast on the Prepper Broadcasting Network. We talk prepping guns and politics every week on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify. Go check out our content at mofpodcast.com on Facebook or Instagram. You can support us via Patreon or by checking out our affiliate partners. I'm your host, Phil Rabley, and my co-host, Andrew Bobo, is on the air side of the mic, and here's your show. Welcome back to Matter Facts Podcast. Phil and Andrew back behind the mic. We have Nick to talk us through how to piss off every one of your local politicians all at the same time. Which is maybe just slight hyperbole, given all the hubbub that's gone on in the 3D printing and the additive manufacturing world around firearms for the last, I don't know. When did 3D printing really burst onto the firearm scene, guys? I mean, I'm struggling. I'm thinking it's been about eight, nine April years. 2013. April 2013. So, yeah, right at, right at 10 years. And time flies when you're... Um, <laughs> I wouldn't say flirting with the law, but trying to convince politics, trying to uh, invent new ways around old problems. Yeah, very true. Very true. Uh, It's definitely come a long way since 2013. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with how the tech, where the technology was at that time. At that time, almost all 3D printers were kit build printers. So DIY, assemble it yourself from a parts kit. And now we've got things like the Bandu P1 and the uh, Creality K1 Speedy that have integrated radar systems for detect, well, LIDAR systems for detecting uh, failed prints, automatic bed leveling, uh, all kinds of fun new toys. Yeah, I mean, I guess my perspective, like from a layperson, is like I remember, I remember 3D printing like way before Cody Wilson, mm-hmm. way before it really came into the firearms world. And it was basically like printing like chitsy stuff out of blue plastic. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like it was in, in its earliest days, it was a cool technology. And I think the people that were very forward thinking were able to really like were able to see that this was this was something that was only going to be limited by the imagination of the people who invested this, themselves in it. You know what I'm saying? Like at, think about when think about every other major manufacturing revolution we've had whether it was mechanized or whether it was assembly line or whether it was casting or forging or anything else it's always been cool now we know how to do this how can we apply it and that that turns into the limiting factor and it only took a certain amount of time for this to find its way into firearms and it was i mean i don't want to spoil the surprise but like you know it was one one kind of crazy guy who had the idea of how can we apply this to firearms? He actually got the idea, believe it or not, <clears throat> from everything I've heard uh, from a movie. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I think it was the original Lost in Space movie. Uh, the dad 3D prints a gun. Essentially, they had a Star Trek like replicator device that could make simple mechanical objects and he makes a gun. I, I am remembering yeah. that now. Oh my yeah. god! So so that's where we are. We don't have flying oh. cars, but we do have three D printing. We've got cars. a lot more than that. Uh, in fact, even dating back to my shorts and <coughs> ill fated college expedition, um, I went to Milwaukee School of Engineering for a short time, and they had a um, selective laser centering three D printer there that could three D print metal objects out of non ferrous me- non ferrous and ferrous metals. It was pretty cool. It was a quarter million dollar machine at the time. Uh, selective laser centering is still one of the most expensive machines to buy. You're talking upwards of $14,000. So it's not something you're going to set up at home. But you don't really need one to make Glock frames. This here is a 3D printed Glock 19 frame. You can see the support interface there. That was made on a $150 Ender 3. So at the time when I bought the Ender 3, it was kind of like, it was kind of the, the entry level printer of entry level printers. Everybody had one and he, and it was what's called a bed slinger. So it's got a build plate of a certain size that moves back and forward in one direction. The, the head that extrudes material moves left and right and up and down. So, um, you got a lot of moving parts there. All 3D printers have moving parts. And there's really there's really three types that you guys need to worry about. SLA, FDM, and SLS. 
Uh, SLS, selective laser centering, phenomenally expensive. You're not going to use it. SLA, SLA or stereolithography printers use a liquid resin that's cured with UV light. Okay. Very simple. You're turning a liquid into a solid. Sounds kind of like what they use in dental. It is exactly what they use to make dental, to make dental stuff. In fact, a lot of the SLA printers started in rapid prototyping for industry. The materials have come a long way, but they're also still pretty hazardous. Um, for instance, some of the household ones can cause chemical burns. Um, you don't want to touch them with your bare skin. They have to be cleaned with isopropyl alcohol and then cured under a UV light after you 3D print them to get full curing. Um, so it's not exactly as beginner user friendly, but they are, at least at the beginning, they were a little bit safer than the FDM printers. Um, FDM printers, you can think of like a MIG welder, but with plastic. So you've got a spool of plastic, this guy right here, with a one kilogram spool of PLA plastic, comes vacuum sealed in the bag. It's, let's see, about 330 linear meters of uh, 1.75 millimeter diameter plastic. That's what most of the commercial or the, the residential printers are going to use. Um, what they do is they liquefy the plastic into a stream, push it through an extruder nozzle of a known size, and draw layers with it, one layer, one area at a time. Um, SLS printers, the selective laser sintering printers, work on a kind of similar principle, except they lay a layer of powder down, and then they pass a laser beam over the areas to basically laser weld them together. Um, mm -hmm. So regardless of what you do, what process you use, 3D printers basically work the same as a 2D printer, except they print a bunch of pages glued together. So your, your normal 2D printer, which is the closest to an FDM, um, goes around, traces a 2D layer of your shape at a known height, extruding plastic, moves up to the next layer and does it again. So your nozzle passes over 100% of the area. Uh, I'm not familiar with SLM there, Josh. Sorry, man. Um, it could be, but I, I haven't used that. I haven't used any of those. You know, if if anybody out there watching wants to get into 3D printing, red, liquid resin, SLA, or FDM are probably going to be one of the two options, or probably going to be your only two options for cost-wise. You can get into an FDM printer for like 150 200 bucks. It's not going to have all the bells and whistles. It'll be safe. Um, but it takes quite a long time and the detail is fairly rough that you can get out of it. You're talking layer lines of about 0.1 millimeters. So I think, what is that converted into standard? Freaking tiny. Uh, not really tiny. It's four thousandths of an inch. Um, you can get freaking tiny to anyone but a machinist you can get or an engineer let yeah me, let me you can that. get less than half of that in a liquid resin printer so you can get down to some of the like the i think the elegu mars will do a one thousandth of an inch layer height so the detail they can get so if you're going to do like art pieces dungeons and dragons miniatures warhammer miniatures those are phenomenal for that the resin is a little more limited than the plastics are for FDM. You have a lot more material options with FDM. Um, like PLA is probably gonna be what you guys are gonna start with. It's super cheap. It's relatively um, durable. You can make gun frames out of it. That's what this is made out of. My other one of these that I have finished has got about 2,800 rounds through it with no failure. So as long as you treat your filament right, get your settings right, it's not a big deal. Um, you can get into more um, engineering type resins, like your PEK, your nylon, your carbon fiber nylon is a new one that came out recently. A lot of guys are using for their ARs. Um, it's got little pieces of carbon fiber in the plastic itself. Um, so. Yeah, it's basically fiber reinforced exactly, plastic yeah, it's, that's it's, been made exactly, into film. Yeah, it's, 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 the nylon filament that you would use, that a lot of people use in 
firearms frames anyway, except with an added filler. You're still going to have the weakness yeah. in your layer lines, like layer to layer. So you you can get failure. Um, this one turned out really well. I don't think there's any imperfections in this one that would show up on camera. But essentially what you can get because you're welding individual layers together, every single one of their layers is a potential failure point. Uh, if it's just like a cosmetic part, like this little guy here is a piece of terrain I built for a Warhammer 40,000 game. Um, the, the layers on this one, not very strong because I printed it pretty rough. You could take this in your hand and break it. It's mostly hollow. In fact, this is probably only a shell of about a millimeter, whereas firearm frame is printed 100%. So this is completely solid plastic all the way through, just like an injection molded part. So you can vary what you want for performance-wise, durability, print speed, um, based on your application. Yeah, Kyle, you do need uh, a computer of some kind. Um, doesn't have to be much. Most laptops will run a slicer software. So, yeah, you know how I was mentioning it, it, it prints like sheets of paper in the different layers. You start with a model, either a model you have made or a model someone else has made. There's plenty of websites where you can get them. And you can either download the model or build the model yourself and then feed it into slicer software. Uh, what that does is, is it lets you orient the model, say for, for this, it's printed bed down. So if my hand is the print bed, the gun was printed, the frame was printed just like this. And it goes through and it slices from the bottom up each of those layers and writes the G code. That G code is then exported to your printer through either a USB connection, a micro SD card, or an internet connection in the case of some of the more modern printers. Now you can, uh, well, I don't know about iPad. There may be slicers that work on iPad. I'm not familiar with the Apple products as much. I mostly run PC. Um, not, now, as far as for like preparedness and self-reliance goes and not just upsetting your local lawmakers making 150 round drums, um, plastic parts break all the time around the house. My old house, I printed a new refrigerator door handle. Took a couple of pieces, epoxied them together, was able to fix my refrigerator without having to go out and buy parts. Are they as good as the consumer grade replacements? Maybe, solid maybe. Um, depending on the age of your filament, because the stuff does degrade with UV light, some of it, uh, depending on how dry it is, all, almost all plastics are hydroscopic, so they'll pull water in from the air. So you do have to dry it after a certain length of time. So like a food dehydrator works really well for that. They do make purpose-built filament dryers that you can just stick your spool in, leave it there, and turn it on. And you can print while it's sitting in there drying. Um, I don't have a purpose-built dryer, but I know they work very well. I use a, like a jerky dehydrator that I pulled all the trays out of. Wet filament, you're going to get more imperfections. You're going to get poorer layer adhesion, and it's not going to stick to your build surface. It would be just like trying to bring a trying to your earlier point. It'd be just like trying to make well right. a wet surface, right. or without flux, or without shielding gas. Yeah, yeah, anything that causes porosity or imperfections is definitely a problem. You know, currently as it stands. Um, some of the better printers like a K1 Speedy runs you about 500 bucks. So if you're looking to get into it, figure out first, well, how big of things do you want to make? Um, the K1 Speedy, I think, has an 8-inch by 8-inch by 10-inch build area. So pretty sizable, 500 bucks. Uh, their next bigger one, I think, is about 11 and a half inches cubed. And that's like 800 bucks. Maybe nine. A uh, spool of filament or a liter of resin is probably going to run you about 15 to 20 bucks, depending on what you get. Um, if you get into the more exotic materials, you could be looking at up to 150 bucks. But that's more for like the peak plastic and whatnot. If you're using those kind of engineering resins, you have a use case for it and it justifies the expense. But so, 
I mean, the thing is, though, is what's interesting is, you know, you're talking about you're talking about 3D printing a refrigerator mm-hmm. handle. Uh, okay, that's cool. But what's interesting is the technology has went from in the last 10 years, the technology has went from, all right, you can kind of afford a maker bot. Right. And and you can kind of afford the and the maker bots were great at the time. And but they, you know, they can only do so much. Whereas now you're getting to the point where it's getting three, it's getting affordable to buy a good enough th- uh, printer where you can print block frames, yep. you can print magazines, stuff like that. Now, but now they're coming out with stuff that you can you can uh, print metal. Mm-hmm. I mean, they have stuff that they're they're making stuff for houses. They're building houses out of three D like three D printing houses. And so, so the idea I've actually that, seen them three D printing a house out of yeah. Houses. There's and that was there's some problems with that. Um, oh, I'm sure. <laughs> it, I'm sure there's a lot of don't problems. Dash. No, no, it's it's close. it's it's not a problem of like the durability of the houses. It's actually a really great idea. The problem is it actually ends up costing way more to build a house that way, because you have all the costs of interior finishing of a concrete brick house and all the costs of hiring out an extreme specialty company. These costs will go down, granted. But really what those companies are doing right now is proof of concept for space exploration. And that's, you know, Mm -hmm. yes. Has 3D printing revolutionized industrial manufacturing? A hundred percent. I will never try to tell you it hasn't. But 3D printing is always, well, I I shouldn't say that. It's almost always more expensive than traditional bulk manufacturing methods. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, especially when you got the like the electrical that goes into it as well. When you have to have run a machine right. for uh, 10 to 15 hours just to print one little one now, thing or whatever, depending on what it is. To make but one unique part, though, it's cheaper. But at volume, right. it's not cheaper. Right, but that's what I'm, but I, but that's what I'm saying, though, is just imagine the, the future. I mean, and, and I know it's not there as far as car parts because you can't get the hardening... The hardening isn't is there isn't there for creating like good nuts and bolts and stuff like that to like to put together a car or anything like that. But the idea that you can 3D print a door handle mm-hmm. for a fridge 15, 20 years ago, 30, 50 years ago. I mean, when our when my like my grandpa and, you know, when uh, when they were younger, they never would have thought that. Oh, gosh, that, no. oh, I'll just, you know, and so and then on top of that, it's like, OK, <clears throat> well, now this this broke. Well, if you have the ability to 3D print metal of any kind, uh, really, I mean, you could sit there and be like, oh, I can, I, if I want to design a crazy door handle or something like you can, and that's the thing is we're getting to that point in our, in, in our technology and in our, we're getting to that point in our, our time really, I guess that we're able to, it's crazy. The things that we're able to do, not just firearms, but you're taking, and I don't think it, I, cause I don't think you're ever going to hurt the commercial market. Uh, because people are going to want to sit there and instead of 3D printing and waiting, they're going to want to go to Home Depot or Menards and, and buy it right away. But if you like the specialty markets, I think you're going to start seeing more of those pop up. You actually are and, starting to see it in uh, in automotive products, specifically custom motorcycles. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So the other thing I was going to point out was it's not like, yes, on large scale, 3D printing is not necessarily as cost effective. For rapid prototyping, it's a hell of a lot faster and a lot cheaper. But the other thing I'm noticing is, like, I have this same discussion about reloading, which both of Mm y'all know enough about to understand where I'm coming from. But I tell everybody, I'm like, you know, if you're trying to beat cost or time investment, loading, like, bulk 9 millimeter with a hand press, you're never going to do it. It's just it's not it's not there. It's not cheap enough to justify the time. You can go put an extra hour of work and completely blow that argument up. But when you start talking about ammunition that is like exotic or when you start looking at like cartridges that are out of production or really off the beaten path stuff, now you're in a situation where the cost to have that produced by somebody else is so high and the time investment to wait is so long, reloading it yourself suddenly makes a hell of a lot more sense all, you know, really, really quickly. And I look at this in somewhat the same guise because like it re- I recently saw where they were starting to 3D print suppressors. And the the trick there is that they're able to make things with additive manufacturing because you're printing it one layer at a time. It's not even that it's cheaper to make it that way. It's impossible to make some of these things 
micro chamber baffles and stuff. Yeah. You know. yeah, and e even in the car world, like I I, I don't recall, I don't remember the details. I'm kind of on the spot here, but I remember reading an article about an AI design car where the the suspension uprights and pieces and everything they weren't straight lines and triangles they were i mean they were weird flowing arcs and everything and it was all mm -hmm. 3d printed because it was like maximum strength for minimum yeah. weight and it's things that it's things like that it's applications that get away from we're trying to reproduce this thing we can make with current design technology with 3d printing and it gets to the point where it's like, no, we're we're making things that cannot be made without 3D printing. And I feel like that's where 3D printing really starts to come to its own is when we stop trying to make it do what the old tech would do. And we start saying, OK, these are things we could dream up, but we literally couldn't. We could not build them with casting. We couldn't yeah. build them with forging. We couldn't build them with machining, but we can build. That's them. actually had a pretty big impact on on my particular industry in mold making. Um, a lot of cooling designs that have come out lately, you can take and build a core that your plastic is molded over with a honeycomb series of helical cooling channels through it that are impossible to machine by any, any mad method that you want to use, except for maybe building a small stack up of inserts down below them that would never be waterproof anyway. But you can 3D print it as one solid contiguous piece of metal. It's 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 going to be interesting, you know. And like, like I mentioned before, space exploration is is really where it's going to be completely revolutionary because no longer would you have to bring all of your spare parts with you, you know. Oh, you can you can you can three D print suppressors. I mean, there are people that are currently form wanting. 3D printed suppressors. I know a couple of people that are working on developing a few and a few outside of the US that are developing them in countries where they're not regulated. And you can 3D print a can for an AR-15. I've seen them function. Yeah. Yeah, Huxworks. Uh, I just looked it up. Out of plastic. Huxworks is one of the it ones it that doesn't even need they to be 3D metal. printed it. Yeah, and oh yeah, it, and it's but it's interesting because that's the thing is they you have the ability for the engineers and everything like that. You can mock up something in metal mm -hmm. uh, to a point, but the way that some of their flow through uh, technology that they've been really pushing <laughs> to actually pull to pull some of the, the, the gases. Now, instead of the gases going back and blowing back into your face, a lot of them now they redirect and they go out the front of the, the suppressor. Yep. And so to me that to me they're and, being able to 3D print it and stuff just makes that product even better. Definitely and does. especially since it's to the tolerances and everything, like they're having great luck with it. And it, I mean, it's lasted, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how many rounds they have through one of them. I can't remember, but uh, they, it, it's went through some FBI, uh, some stuff with the FBI, some uh, different tests and to figure out what the fail point is and uh, everything like that. And they're, they're not failing. They're, they're, be they're just as good and they're lighter. Yeah. And, and pretty much lighter than a standard suppressor that's made out of a uh, um, metal. Right, because it and really only has to be self-supporting. Mm -hmm. It does not and need to support is, machining pressures. Exactly. And see, that's the thing is, uh, what company was it? Uh, AAC, I don't remember what company it was. They just released a, uh, a series, uh, basically a recall on a, on a, on a line of suppressors. Mm -hmm. Um, for a certain number, I can't remember how, what the number exact uh, for the range was, but they uh, they found a, a weakness in one of the welds. Mm. They found a, mm. uh, a weak point to where it was it was it was blowing. Okay. It was because of the gases and all that stuff. It was it was blowing. Uh, it was causing failure, catastrophic catastrophic failures. And if you have the, I mean, and so yeah, that's. That's one thing. And yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that the 3D printing stuff can't fail. Oh, it, it, could. it can. It has every possibility yeah. of failure of a traditional weld line. Exactly. But if you if you have if you have a series of 3D printers set up and you have, OK, this is this suppressor, this the program that you have, the, the file that you have, you know, it works. It's been proven to work. You have that exact same file that you go to each or, you know, you print every single time off of with the exact same, like the filament, uh, like the filament brand or whatever mm -hmm. it is, like you, you keep to the certain specs, the, the, the likelihood of it failing are extremely, it low. is, it is lower 
But unfortunately, with um, with the SLS printers, which they're using the selective laser sintering to print those, I believe it's selective laser sintering to get the tolerances they're trying to achieve. You mm -hmm. do have to x-ray everything that comes off those to ensure that you don't have any voids. Because if you, I mean, get, that, that's, yeah, if yeah. you get excess humidity in that powder, because it's a very, very fine powder and it sticks together, yeah. you now have a void where that metal is not centered. Although I was going to point out in industrial applications, when you're talking about like pipe fitting a welding, they, they x-ray all do. that anyway for the exact Absolutely. same reason. So can't really say that's a downside. When no, it's but like... it's a consideration <laughs> in your costs for sure. Yeah. And now, you know, right, but I mean, but I, that all goes down to QA. It though. does. I mean, that's all, that's all yeah. QA. So, so I mean, but that's the thing though is having the ability to X-ray, take the time. Okay, we have this extra cost on, of an X-ray machine or whatever we got to do with it, and then you have that extra cost, but you can 3D print, and your cost of creating that printer or the cost of building that suppressor just cut in half well basically. your, your, and then your now, operator you know, costs are really where you're going to save right. a lot you know uh, a skilled machine operator like myself can demand depending on the area wages in excess of 40 or 50 dollars an hour and if you've got to pay a guy 40 or 50 dollars an hour to run off your suppressor parts well it's so when, when do metal printers become affordable um probably going to be a few years <laughs> They are, they are affordable now. If you're a corporation, you know, what's your definition? Right. I mean, affordable? let's be honest here. We all have some pretty expensive hobbies. Shooting being one of them. I guarantee some of no, you in this chat have spent over fourteen k on firearms and ammo. <laughs> I don't want to talk about the bag that's right here at my right foot with the nods in it. Yeah. Anybody, anybody running dual tubes can probably, can probably justify a metal 3d printer if they felt like it. Um, I mean, they, go, went, Andrew. they went from, they went from being a quarter million dollars to like 14 or $15,000. Oh, positively well, paltry. I mean, let me just go smash component. the piggy bank for that. <laughs> I mean, really, when you think about it for the capacity it gives you, either as a business or as an individual. And yes, these things are going to continue to come down in cost. I mean, look at the uh, laser en engraving cutting machines. You can buy a 20 watt laser engraver right now for $1,400. Now that's not getting close to the 80 watt and hundred watt and higher laser centering heads that you got to have, but it's getting there. Uh, these new these new laser cutting engraving heads that people are using are LED diodes, so you don't have to have purged carbon uh, purged uh, carbon monoxide tubes or CO two tubes or any of those consumables. You just have a, di a series of diodes that project the laser, brings the cost down mm -hmm. astronomically. As those three D better... printing, three D printing to me is uh, it, it reminds me. I, I, I look at it a lot like reloading. I have the ability mm -hmm. to, I have the supplies, but do I want to? No, I don't want to sit down and re reload. I will, I'd rather spend the money and actually buy rounds mm -hmm. sure. uh, that are already loaded. And you know, you're, you're basically, you're paying for that convenience of them being loaded. Now, if I'm looking at fine tuning a load, like what Phil does and or what Phil's looking at doing, then yeah. I could definitely sit down and fine tuning because that's what I will be doing with my six five free right. more is I will be I have a couple hundred rounds that I'm gonna sit down and I you know I have a, a K or I have a round a grain that I like that it likes and shoots well and I'm gonna load up a bunch of that stuff. I now yeah, I can understand that. But just like three D printing, it's one of those things it's like, well, I don't know, I'd rather pay you and your <laughs> take your some money to do it. And yeah. I mean, there are a lot of 3D printing places for hire right now. In fact, you go on Etsy, you go on Fiverr, you go on Zometry, you can order stuff 3D printed shipped to your door. Right. Very simple, very easy, no muss, no fuss. What I like about having the 3D printers is if I need something that does not exist, I could either A, design it up, take it down to work, machine it out of whatever stock I've got, fine. Or I can model it up, fire off my 3D printer, and walk away for 12 hours and do something else for more productive with my time. So currently, right now, downstairs, I have some uh, 
some 3D printed terrain for D&D that's being ripped off right now. Uh, so I paid somebody 20 bucks for his models because they looked great. Running it off right now. It's going to cost me about a buck 45 in filament and about 29 cents in electricity to buy this stuff. Um, pre-made online, you're looking at probably 15 or 20 bucks. Yeah, I think the uh, I think the other thing about 3D printing that like really interests me is when you start playing around with things yeah. like the infill. You know what I'm saying? Like that's uh, that's one of those that's one of those things where like I see the ability that of I always look for ways that one technology I look for the how can I put it this way? It's the opposite of like a Venn diagram. It's like this will do this and this will do this, but what will this do that yep. this will not? And when you start talking <clears throat> about like infill like think about like this if you wanted let's say you wanted to take something like an ar-15 lower for example and you wanted to make the walls yep hollow you can that's technically doable but can you make those walls hollow filled with Mm -hmm. a honeycomb absolutely you get to a point where with traditional machining oh yeah (laughs) so you you see but and and you cannot do that with casting can't be done can't be done with forging i don't think either like i guess i'm saying is like you get to a point where things that are to your to to, to your initial reaction like oh yeah that's easy it's really easy for additive manufacturing but for traditional subtractive manufacturer casting it is it ranges between impossible down to severely difficult so you get to the point where it's like the things that to me the things that 3d printing does well are things that if traditional manufacturing can't do them it becomes much more difficult and much more expensive much more time consuming versus three for 3d printing you literally like hypothetically slide a slider bar to decrease your infill that is exactly how that that works it is it is literally a slider bar Yeah. So d- with with that simple flick of a wrist, you've yes. decreased the weight and probably the strength to some degree. Listen, no. But you have the ability to play with those things. To a yeah, degree. the um, they're actually seeing a lot of advancements in ultra high performance aircraft and drones, um, be, even with the metal three D printed parts. The um, the ability to just do the shell, which is where most of your strength comes from on a polymer printed part anyway. The honey, the, the mm-hmm. internal infill is really just to support the outer shell as it's printing. The um, one that I can think of right now is uh, landing gear on aircraft. There's a ton of material that has to be there just because of the connecting features. So you got to have the hub for the wheel that holds the bearings. That's got to be so much bigger in order to be welded to the uprights that go into the hydraulics up top. Turns out you don't need the majority of that material inside of the pipe. What you need is just a certain amount of volume um, just to get from point A to point B. And the less material you have in between, the better you get. Well, with some of these high performance landing gear that they're doing out of magnesium and a few other a few other metals, titanium, for instance, they're doing um, like 30 to 40 percent weight reductions in key key components. That's huge in aircraft and drones. I mean, also huge in space exploration, because I, don't, I mean, you you and I both know that. When it comes to payload cost, the heavier it is, the more oh, money yes. it costs. Because every every extra pound that the the launch vehicle weighs is a pound of less fuel. you can put up in space. Yeah. But it's a pound less fuel or a pound right. less payload. And let's let's call it what it is. The heavier <clears throat> the vehicle is, it takes yep. more fuel. So you have to have X amount of fuel for X amount of weight. And there's no there's not many ways to cheat that arrangement. No, and there is a hard so limit what on what you wind up doing is, yeah. But what you want to do is you want to produce yep. your payload. And it, if it if you can get less payload in space in one run, your cost goes through mm-hmm. the ceiling. I mean, I, I'm, I'm the business. I'm the business yep. economics guy. I mean, that's just the way. Same it for aircraft. Now. Same for drone flight time. Yeah. You know, a lot of these guys out there now that are making their own DIY drones are printing them in carbon fiber nylon. Because they can do entirely hollow frames. And so... They can and they can actually print the frame in two halves, or print the frame part way up, run the wires through the hollow frame, and then tell the printer go ahead and finish, and it prints the rest of the frame with the wires integral to the frame. 
And the very interesting thing about this discussion is, as your weight comes down, your strength requirement Does. comes down too. Not the not exactly the same. No. It's not one to one, but if the if the especially if we're talking about aircraft, because that was my first love. If we're talking about aircraft, like the heavier it is, the heavier it has to be. The landing gear has to be heavier in rotary wing aircraft. Your rotor head has to be heavier. Your blades have to be heavier. Everything has to be heavier. But if you make it lighter, then the stress placed on all those things that hold it up off the ground or hold it in the air decrease as well. It's it's an interest. It's like two bell curves that are chasing. Yeah, and, and the lower your fuel requirements, so the longer your flight time, the less fuel you have to carry, so the less strength the plane has to have. It all. It, it, it's kind of an interesting feedback loop right there. And that's why I, that's why I always tell people you want to you want to explore space, invest in three D printing. That's that's really what's what going to be. So Nick, <clears throat> I mean, kind of you, you saw where the you you've seen. I mean, we've all seen it, but you really since you pay a lot more attention to it than I, like I do. Uh, I mean, you've seen where we've gone in the last ten years as far as mm -hmm. tech. Where do you see it, say, in the next in the next 10 years? Where do you think it's going to go or where are the signs pointing to? You know how everybody and their brother that's any kind of handy has got a miter saw? Got a circular mm -hmm. saw, mm -hmm. got a cordless drill, might even have cordless of the other two, maybe even a cordless table saw. That's where we're going. These things are going to become ubiquitous. Every household is going to have one. Maybe not in 10 years, but anybody that's moderately tech savvy, anybody that... Um, that is, does any kind of, you know, fiddle farting around in the garage, Wh whatever your hobby is, 3D printing can enable that hobby to go a little bit further. And as they become more and more of an appliance, the more people are going to be able to use them. When I got into 3D printing about 10 years ago, it was not an appliance. You were going to have to tinker with it. You were going to have to troubleshoot it. You were probably going to have to understand some electrical wiring because stuff stuff was, was going to break experiment at that point stuff was going to break a lot you know it's um i think that in 10 years we're going to see definitely homeowner level sls laser centering from powder 3d printing i don't think there's any there's anything in the way of that other than the cost coming down on the laser heads because the only difference right now between an FDM printer and an SLS printer is the laser heads and the powder feed mechanisms. And the powder feed mechanisms are not that complicated. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing, too, is, uh, I mean, we were talking politics with it, uh, where as things get going, as things keep going forward, I mean, you already have New York that's like talking about background checks mm -hmm. for 3D printers and all kinds of stupid crap. Uh, if it starts becoming more and more of a household item, do you think that there's going to be some political kickback from it? Like you think that they're going to sit there and they're going to try to regulate it because they're seeing they're going to try to get ahead of the, the they're going to try to get ahead of the industry. Uh, and I know like your your name, your title on underneath your name says you can't stop the signal, which you can't. Uh, once it's online, like, I mean, you really, you can't stop it. You can't get that back. And so, and that's, what's funny. I mean, tie, you know, tying it back into the, the gun industry, <clears throat> they're trying hard. They are really trying hard to, uh, to stop people from 3d printing from, uh, from creating the, the I mean, the frames and receivers rule and stuff is basically sure. directed at this pretty much. Sure. But it's and, completely inc incapable of stopping anything. That's, that's the thing. Right. April it's 20, just going to drive underground is the way I yeah, see it. April 2013 was the death of gun control. Whether or not anyone wants to admit it, gun control died April 13th with Cody Wilson. Exactly. Which, by the way, and I've told both of y'all this, that I have an unabashed man crush on this guy. That group. guy's got some good In ideas. In the most heterosexual way <laughs> humanly possible. <laughs> I'm just saying, like he, he, you're right. He, he drove a stake into the heart of gun control on that day. Like the moment, the moment he did two things: he posted those files on the internet, and he released the video that the damn thing didn't blow itself up. The minute that happened, to me, Proof gun control. Died. Well, I remember. Well, I, I just remember it was funny because I remember uh, talking to someone. I used to at one of my old jobs about it, and we were talking about Cody Wilson, and we we're talking about the. Uh, the 3D printing and all that stuff. And it was funny because, uh, you know, Diane Feinstein 
uh, may she rot in the underground hell that we have. Uh, she was like pushing the assault weapons ban, magazine ban, multiple states pushed magazine bans and stuff like that. I think Colorado passed theirs or something. One of the states did. And uh, he released the 3D printed mag. The Mendez and mag. Like, yeah. And it's just like, <laughs> named right, after well, Senator Mendez. <laughs> yeah. And it, yeah. That means nothing. And then, uh, and then the lower, like they were sitting there and they were throwing a fit about the lower and he was just like, and I remember he posted one video and it did, I think it did fail, but then he was like, here's version two and he fixed the issue and it like, it never failed. So, and that's the thing is like, and that, and that's where I, I really see that's where the whole gun control, the gun control fight is they're trying to get ahead of what they see possibly coming down the pipe, but they can't get ahead of it. There's, there, it's a speeding train going <laughs> down a track to where like, and they can't outrun it. They cannot, there's nothing they can do. And literally the only thing they could do is basically make firearms illegal. Like you, it would be because a federal that law. Great okay. For cocaine, didn't Andrew, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So here's, here's one for that. Make firearms illegal. Have you ever heard of Arc Flash Laboratories? Yeah. Okay. Yes. That's not a like firearm. This. <laughs> That's a Gauss rifle. It is not regulatable under any existing firearms laws. It's full auto. It's not a machine gun. By definition. Well, anybody that's curious, uh, look that up on Forgotten Weapons. They did a nice little video on at least two the of the models. Flash of the GR1 and... Anvil or Sledgehammer. I can't remember which one it is. Uh, yeah, one it's, the other. it's pretty impressive. It it throws, I believe it's a quarter inch or a three-eighths diameter steel dowel rod at something like 75 feet per second. It's very slow. But it's another proof of concept. And guess what, boys and girls? It's mostly 3D printed. Mm-hmm. And the other cool thing about that that weapon in particular and the concept behind like Gauss rifles. Uh, Gauss rifles, yeah, but they used another term. They said it was something it wasn't yeah, magnetically terrible. accelerated projectile. Yeah, there's yeah. there's a lot of different terms for it. Yeah. But basically what they said was that because of the mechanics, the electromechanics mm -hmm. of how the silly thing works there is kind of a baked in limitation to, to your, your velocity. Cause like there's only so fast you can turn the electromagnets in that series but on and weight. off with any kind of current technology, but there's, but the limit on weight is much, much mm -hmm. higher. So we could wind up in a situation Musket where balls. like, where it's a traditional fire, let's say an AR 15 fire 55 grain bullet at 3000 feet per second. And this thing will just hurl a bowling ball at you with 70 feet yeah. per second. You know, and that's, that's, that's another point, you know, they, they want to try to get ahead of you know, as Andrew was saying, try to get ahead of what's coming. Well, too bad. So sad. You're 10 years too late. You were, yeah. no, they're, you yeah, were 10 years no too way. late when Cody released the Liberator. I mean, once, yeah. once somebody got the idea now, granted Cody was the first one to do it publicly. I would not be surprised if other people had done it privately and stayed below the radar. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, if you think about it, it's, if, yeah, if one person's done it, you know other people have done it. Probably. Um, I mean, he's a smart kid. He really is. But he he yeah. wasn't really applying anything other than the same principle applied behind the hardware store 12 gauge made out of black pipe and a two by four. I mean, mm -hmm. you can make mm -hmm. a gun out of just about anything that'll hold pressure. Turns out that's an awful lot of things. You know, and, and now that it's gotten to the point where anyone and i do mean anyone which is the downside to it is even children can do this so be mindful of your kids around 3d printers i guess the it's no longer a guy like me with a bridgeport mill in his garage going hey, i'm gonna make an ar because i can no now it's a now it's anybody that has 150 dollars yeah expedient homemade firearms that's a great one P.A. Luddy would really be proud. Um, <clears throat> in fact, there's Defense Distributed that Cody started has sort of morphed into Deterrence Dispensed, which is a group of people that do nothing but develop 3D printed firearms, 3D printable firearms, mm -hmm. specifically firearms to be built in countries where guns are completely outlawed that use zero firearms components. 
Well, isn't Defense Distributed also the same company that uh, produces and markets the I believe uh, Ghost it is, Gunner? Yeah. Uh, two two separate comp- two separate so. groups, but yeah, it's the same people running it. I'm, yeah. as far as I'm aware. You know, as as far as yeah, New York that, wanting to ban 3D printers or register 3D printers or regulate them, best of luck with that. It's a circuit board, some thin gauge copper wire, some stepper motors that you can buy off of quite a number of websites and Radio Shack, if you still have one, welded together to some aluminum extrusion that you can buy off McMaster car by 10 foot increments. You, you can't, you cannot stop people from building these things. I mean, they've been building them right. from kits without video instructions, with just PDF instructions for two decades now. I think the argument in play here is the same one that Cody lodged, though, which was you can't ban firearms without banning the knowledge of how Correct. to build firearms. And that that is impossible. Especially now. And that's the same. Again, it's kind of the same thing I said at the very top of the show. Like 3D printing is an amazing, amazing manufacturing technology. But at the end of the day, it's just another method it of is. manufacturing. So when you apply it to firearms, the real thing is if you know how firearms work and let's call it what it is. A single shot hammer fired anything ain't that freaking you know complicated to design or build, but if you know how they work, it's not hard to build them. I mean, like uh, to my point earlier, Expedient Homemade Firearms, Philip A. Ludi, the guy who, by the way, was a friggin' Brit who made wrote this book and built these two squirt guns as a political fu to his government and when they died in prison firearms. for the pleasure. He, yes. But he built a pair of 9mm full-auto submachine guns with firearms regulations that are at least twice as stringent as what we have here in the U.S. Because unlike our laws, theirs were written by people that apparently know something about firearms. So they regulated the pressure-bearing components. So things like the barrel, the bolt face, things that are kind of complicated to build. So he wrote those instructions to go get stuff from a hardware store that was never meant to make firearms. Like, do your own rifling, do everything. I've read, I've got a copy of the book. I don't think I'll ever try it, but... Trying it would be a felony. (laughs) Yes, but it's... I mean, look, that might almost be worth friggin' like getting, you know, getting an SOT and everything just to try it, see if you can pull it off. But it's, it's just, it's an incredible book to read just to see the stuff he thought through to to bend around all these firearms. I, I can tell you, I have never done it, but I have thoroughly read through the instructions. It is not difficult to do. If you have a photocopier, a hacksaw, a set of files, a Dremel and a drill, pl- a drill press, you're fine. In fact, you could probably do it with a handheld corded drill if you weren't too particular about how the finished product look. It's well, the thing is, though, too, is I mean, the whole politics uh, thing is you have you have I mean, California has been uh, extremely famous for trying to limit uh, the magazine capacity they're, they They've been trying to neuter the AR-15 platform for, uh, for I mean, ever since it came out, really. 30 and, years, uh, probably. Yeah. And so that's the thing is. But what's funny is as soon as something comes out you have a company that's just like California compliant this. And then California is like, I'm going to do this. And then California compliant this, like they are constantly right on the foothills of making something that is uh, compliant to that area, to that area. And what's interesting is sometimes they make something that is actually, it almost makes a platform in a way better Mm -hmm. uh, with how, with how it functions and stuff like that. And so like the, it's just innovation and you can't stop the innovation. No, you can't. And with firearms so ingrained in our society, I, I mean, good luck stopping it. You never will. Yeah. And, and that's where you're saying, you know, that's why I agree with you is the, the, <clears throat> the gun, the anti-gun establishment, it, it's, it's a deer that's already been shot through the heart and it's just, it's running on adrenaline yeah. and it, eventually it's just going to topple over and die, which it, that would be awesome if it did now. Honestly, oh, geez, the way it's going to die is with magnetically accelerated weapons. That's, yeah. that's probably what it's going to be because they would have Just give to give me a pulse in, rifle, a pulse rifle from aliens. Right, That's pulse what, rifle with fifty five rifle. Fifty five wide range. You. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, energy weapons, yeah, they're a long way off. But magnetic weapons, especially mm-hmm. with the new capacitors coming out, uh, graphene based capacitors that can charge in tenths of a second when provided with enough power supply, you can shoot an awful lot 
an awful lot faster. I mean, their current, I think their current, uh, the GR2 is uh, capable of 100 rounds a minute, which is, that's oh. impressive. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's the thing. I'm though, thinking so about pre ordering one. <laughs> Technically not <laughs> well, illegal in Illinois yet. <laughs> yeah. AR-15s yeah. are illegal. Magnetically accelerated full autos are not. But that's the thing, though, is like it's interesting because every every few years you have uh, you look at the industry. I mean, you look at any industry, but the firearms industry, since we're talking about that, is every few years you see a uh, somebody who creates a firearm that revolution revolutionizes yeah. the industry. The AK-47, I mean, was was crazy with how just. It, the way it was made, how cheap it was made, and then how it just ran, and then now, now that then you had the AR-15 and stuff like that. You have certain firearms that have come out that just do amazing job for pushing the the envelope. It, we're due for something. The trouble is, we're, we're getting we're to due, the end of what for. chemical propellants can give us. Right, but that's what I'm yeah. saying though. Is going off of like what you're talking about. <clears throat> we're we're due for something new. And so I think I, I believe that within the next five to ten years, uh, if not sooner, I believe that we are going to have a new, a new platform that is it no longer because especially since the regulations on uh, the ATF is looking at, they want to re-regulate uh, uh, powder and stuff like the way that it's stored and all kinds mm -hmm. of crap. And then on top of that, the way they just changed their rule on, I mean, this has, I mean, going into the the rule changing is. Um, but they just changed their uh, the rule for um, uh, paintball, like simunition, like flashbangs, yeah. smoke grenades, all that stuff. They just mm -hmm. quietly changed their ruling on it or their opinion on it, and now you have to get a you have to you have to get a permission slip in order to even get these things now. Uh, and and by the way, on that note, this is after they had already changed it once. Because there was a time when you could order the airsoft like flashbangs mm -hmm. and smoke grenades and everything free yep. and clear. And then they were, if I recall correctly, they've already, they already got reclassified once. Because you had to have a uh, you had to have an explosive hips license from the ATF to, to get yeah. them. No, um, so that's what they just changed. Or that's is that they just they changed. changed? Yeah, they just changed that. Gotcha. So but that's the thing, though, is like if you can sit there and three D print something, or like the the new technology comes out to where you can create something that will make that smoke, pick, you know, if you make that smoke that, and then you can basically it's not it's not an explosive, but I don't know chemical, I, I don't know, pick your whatever it is. But the, there's going to be there. We're due for my point is is we're due for another, some we're due for another step to revolutionize the industry. Oh, definitely. And I, and I think it's, I, th I think, I think we're going to see it within the next five to 10 years, if not under five. Do a Google search for electronic mm -hmm. flashbang. You'll thank me later. Somebody has already created, a, it's a little, little freaking grenade shaped thing. And it's all it does is with like an ear bleeding volume. It reproduces the sound of a flashbang. So you're not going to end a, uh, has a high intensity strobe light on top of it. So you're not going to get like the pressure wave from Yet. a flashbang, but you get the noise and you get the, 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 the bright flashlight to disorient your target. Phil, do you think you could disorient someone with a set of speakers? Um, I have disoriented someone with a set of Yet. speakers. It's not that small yet. The technology is coming. Yeah. That's the thing. <clears throat> well, and also, also bear in mind that, you're making a reference to my car mm -hmm. audio days. When you when you try to create a noise that loud with a very low frequency, like a subwoofer, it actually takes a tremendous amount more movement in the speaker cone with very high with very high pitch noises. It can be yeah. done fairly easily. Like if you're if you're trying to make a noise that's anything over like five to six thousand hertz, it's not really that hard to make it like 145, 150 yep. decibels. You could do it with a pretty small speaker and not a tremendous amount. See, that's the thing. You know, it'd be a darn shame if, say, Deterrence Dispensed had also had already published 3D printable grenade shells for smoke grenades. Oops. Right. <laughs> yeah. They're already behind again. The other thing, thing, thing I want. Well, and since we're talking about defense distributed, I did want to work in one other thing was like, I, I remember when, 
Okay, so the Ghost Gunner, for anybody that's not aware, and you should look it up, it's pretty cool. It's it's a simple enough piece of kit, but it's a cool application, in my opinion. But literally all it does is it takes an 80% AR lower, and it finishes it for you. So it does all the machining work, does it all for you. What I saw that company do when the ATF really was first starting to start chirping about the frames and receiver rules, I saw Defense Distributed immediately start retooling the ghost gunner the next version of the ghost gunner to be able to machine ar lowers from zero mm, billet stocks so yep you literally take a piece of billets now if i remember right i think you it it basically it had to machine in two pieces and they were like almost like handgun slide rails to like mm -hmm. shove the two together yeah to fit in the build platform in their, fir in their first gen of that their newest ones it's a single monolithic piece yeah but literally, insert a piece of metal, yep. press button, walk away, and fully, fully machine AR lower. Yeah, that light. product is basically that, a desktop CNC vertical milling center. Yeah. Yeah, but I guess you know that like that's what we're talking about here is like you you cannot stop innovation, you cannot regulate the knowledge of how to make firearms, you cannot you cannot do that. There is no way to stop. This well, you could started. like, but you'd have to imprison <clears throat> every single machinist, gunsmith, hobbyist. It's I mean, you could do it. It would require a. There's going to be a lot of Soviet, trees getting watered. Right, if that exactly. Happens. It would require <laughs> a, a relocation of peoples to like a Soviet era camp. It'd be easier to relocate all of Congress. Buildings and all. Anyway. But like. Plus, you cripple it, it, your. Economy. I wrote an article. Yeah. I wrote an article a long time ago that kind of gets into some of these principles, and I won't recount all of it here because if y'all are really that curious, y'all can go find it. I mean, it's on mofpodcast.com, but it was talking about, like, high-level legal principles like mala prohibite, mala, mala in se. In other words, whether something is illegal because it's genuinely bad or just it's illegal because some politician passed a law. And I've always placed firearms in the mala prohibita. Mm -hmm. Pot, which basically says government said it's bad therefore it's bad but the people don't it's bad believe for it's the bad. government and that's why you have this well but that's why you have this constant push back and forth between the regulations that are passed or rules that are interpreted or whatever other mechanism they use and then the people who say i just found a way around your law i just found a way around your rule i just made something california compliant i just figured out how to print it off of a 3d printer i just figured out how to make it in my garage you're always going to have this this disagreement between the regulators and the people as long as people can continue to consider firearms ownership a right and therefore they do not consider it to be intrinsically evil right. and i think that's like i like i think that you're right as long as the trend of 3d printing continues to be that this becomes more mainstream it goes into more homes more people get their hands on it I think you're going to naturally have between that in tandem with the Second Amendment movement where we're pushing really hard to get younger shooters involved and get younger people involved in this because, like, this cannot just be a hobby of 40-plus-year-old right. men or it's going to die. And let's call it what it is. Like, my daughter is 11 years old. She probably knows more about 3D Oh, I'm sure she does. Me. And it would not surprise me if she's used them as much as some hobbyists that are very enthusiastic. I mean – a lot of schools have been bringing them in. They're a perfect way to introduce kids to to rapid prototyping and manufacturing technologies to CAD systems. I mean, let's be honest here. What do you need to get started 3D printing? Okay, you need the printer. You can start 150 to a thousand dollars, depending on the size you want. You need a couple hundred dollar laptop. You probably already have one at home or your PC, and you need a either in a solid model created by somebody else, an STL file or uh, one of the other varieties of files, or you need 3D modeling software and willingness to learn how to use it. Fusion 360 is free for hobbyists. Let me tell you guys, Fusion 360 is what I use at work for full simultaneous four axis programming on a vertical milling center. That software is pretty powerful. Is it the best? Yeah, probably not. But it doesn't cost $15,000 a seat either. You want to pay for the full version, it's about $500 a year. But if you're a hobbyist and you make less than $100,000 a year, it's free. It has full native 3D printing. So you take your Fusion 360. You no longer need a, a slicer software now because it's got an inbuilt slicer. 
you, you pull, you design up your model or pull in your model, pick your 3d printer from a lineup of machines that it's already pre-programmed to work with, which and it's most of them. Hit go generates the G code, walk that over to your machine, slide it in, hit go. If you have all your tweaking done right, as far as your bed leveling, which a lot of the new printers do for you, if you have your filament temperature set right, which most manufacturers recommendations now are pretty darn good. You come back in anywhere from 30 minutes to, to two days and you've got whatever you asked for. It's, it's simple. I suddenly had an ADHD moment and wondered if I could run a 3D printer on my Jackery while it charges from the They sun. take some power. That's one big downside to them. They need a consistent mm. power supply because you've got to, especially the FDMs, because if that hot end cools down or the bed cools down, it can pop off the bed or it can clog. You can run them off a generator. I've seen people running them off a generator. It's not super cost effective. If you had a solar setup with a big battery pack, I mean, it just depends on how long you're printing really is what it's gonna come down to. So for an emergency situation, is it ideal? No, not yet, absolutely not yet. But as our power storage technology gets better and our implementation of solar energy gets better or say localized miniature nuclear reactors start getting put in, which is really what they should do if they wanna save the environment, um, we could eliminate all carbon output from our, from our, uh, power production and give everybody reliable power at the same time at lower cost, then yeah, it'll be great. You know, in a grid down situation, your 3d printer is going to be basically useless, unfortunately, unless you have a pretty badass yeah. generator or a really big solar setup. It wasn't a serious thought. It was just you, an ADHD. You movie. probably could, though. That's the thing. Is it's, it's only 120. It takes a 120 outlet. So it's not like it's drawing that much power. I mean, if you put a meter on it, you could figure out what it's going to draw. It's probably going to be as much as, well, let's see. Well, the last thing about it like this, if it's running off of a standard 110 outlet, it's got to be capped at 10 amps. Uh, that depends on what which printer you get. I mean, if it's running on 110. A single uh, outlet. It could be up to 20, I think, on a single outlet. Ooh. But I don't know about I don't know about the 3D printers. I can let me take a look quick. Now that I have totally completely sidebarred oh, the conversation for my own purposes. Uh, 0 0.12 kilowatts per hour is its average power consumption. So 253 watts peak consumption. 253 yeah. watts. That's no, not awful. no, it's not awful. You can build a solar setup that'll handle that. I'm, I'm sure there are some people in the Patreon group that oh, are already running the math. Yeah, 250 watts. That's two and a half amps, yeah. 2.2 amps. No, it's not so bad. It's really not bad at all. I really, there are there are months where I run my 3D printer pretty much constantly, and I don't notice an appreciable difference in my power consumption at home. Not really. Well, 0. 0.12 kilowatt hours is less than a decent sized refrigerator oh, yeah. pulls. Yeah. yeah, your your chest freezer is pulling a lot more. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, Quite I know mine is. Well, Nick, um, that's uh, I don't know your the knowledge that you have with uh, printers is uh, is crazy. Like that's well, <laughs> I mean, it, it makes me want one, uh, definitely because of the the what you could build and all that stuff. It's crazy. Uh, but I'm 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 really curious to see where the industry goes. It, it's going to go. I think it's only going to go up, uh, and especially with the space exploration kind of aspect of it pushing that. Uh, I think we're we're in for a treat for the next you know many years to see where things. You know, go. it's it's going to be a while before we get replicator level technology. It's going to be an awful long while. But there are people that are that are working on multi-material printers that can print circuit boards, conductive circuit boards already. So mm -hmm. it's coming. It's coming fast. Yeah, awesome. Well, cool. Um, might have to. We should have you. I know you don't have very much spare time, but uh, you should. I can make. We time. can get you to write up a, uh, an article uh, on how to get started uh, with some maybe some recommendations and stuff like that. We could put that on the website. Yeah, I could probably work on that. 
probably after after the holidays here. Oh yeah, no, for sure. me and my wife were yeah, just no, talking about cool Thanksgiving. Because... Like, Jesus, it's yeah, that time again. Yeah, it's right around the corner. Yeah. So, but no, that'd be cool because uh, I know a lot of people would be if they're interested. It's like, okay, well, where do I begin? Yeah, so, and if if anybody, if before I get that done, anybody's got questions, find me in the Facebook group, find me in the Patreon chat. I'm in there. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So now I just have to figure out how I can smooth over buying a 3D printer. Oh, tell your wife it's for cool. your daughter's education and enrichment. Yeah. Nick, you are a, you are an instigator of poor financial decisions. <laughs> I like that in you. I've been known to enable. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you have some work to do to beat the king, the king enabler. Yeah, that's true. I didn't do nothing. But yeah. we're not going to talk about that. I was going to say, I'm pretty sure it was your wife that made that purchase. Yeah, <laughs> so that's not me. So, But no, thanks for coming on, Nick. You're welcome. Uh, look forward to talking to you more. And um, yeah, I'll have to get you on again here sure. and talk more about this kind of stuff and uh, all that. So Yeah, glad, glad I could help you guys. Let me know when. Yeah, definitely thanks for coming on, man. Like, it, this is one of those subjects where, like, I know it in the broad strokes from, like, 50,000 feet, but I don't know it like you do. So I appreciate you coming on and talking to everybody about it. Now, hopefully we have uh, instigated more financial tomfoolery <laughs> among the listeners. And if anybody gets into 3D printing as a result of hearing this or is curious more about it, like, reach out to me and I can put you in touch with Nick and might have to become part of the regular conversation. Sure But we all have dinner to eat. Turkey Day is fast approaching. Everybody, please take care of yourselves. And if you can't be good, be good at it. Matter of fact, it's going out the door. Bye, everybody. Bye.